what I would like to do is talk about three things, chemical synthesis, nanoparticle synthesis, and chemical and, and cell manipulations of cells, in particular transvection of molecules across the cell membrane. And it will be mostly chemical and my nanoparticle and a little bit about cells to kind of stay with the chemical uh, features of the talk. So why would one want to do microfluidics in a small scale, to chemistry in a small scale? After all, when you think about chemistry, you think about people who make large amounts of chemistry like fibers and um, additives and fuels and so on. But there are advantages to going small. You, if you work at a small scale, you have increased safety. You can get the energy out of the system. You can go to high pressures. Uh, you can work with toxic intermediates and at the end of the game not have any toxic intermediate left. And that actually allows you to expand the toolbox so that you can do new chemistries, you can do reactions under conditions that are normally very difficult to do safely in a laboratory. And since it's a continuous process and it's steady state, it can be controlled and you can scale it. And I will show examples of how you actually can go from the small scale up towards much larger scales. The other thing, of course, that's really important, and we often use microfluidics, and I think Daniel Bonn after me will talk much more about this, is that you can use this to learn and get information. So we can screen for reactions, which ones are actually feasible. Um, I'm sure you've all had the, if you've done chemistry, you've had the pleasure of taking out a recipe and trying to run that reaction and trying to figure out why it won't run the way that the authors described it to be run. And in many cases, it's because there's just a piece of invalid important information that was forgotten. But imagine that we could actually take these reactors and we could make recipes that everyone could run and we could find out which reactions are truly infeasible and which one can be run. We can also get kinetics so we can know how fast reactions are, which becomes very useful in terms of scale up. Um, and then ultimately, we can optimize reactions. So much of it work in a chemistry laboratory involves actually finding the optimal conditions and you run the same reactions over and over again. It's tedious uh, and it uses a lot of materials that you then have to dispose of. So um, much of my talk will deal with uh, the reactors that we use because of the issue of chemical stability. We tend to not use PD PDMS, um, but we use the reactors. They're built by photolithography and silicon and then anodically bonded to glass to Birex, which makes them able to withstand very high pressures and temperatures. And of course, it's really your own uh, imaginations that limits your design in these particular cases. These have one common feature. They all have this area where the silicon is missing, and that is to provide a thermal barrier so that this is a poor thermal conductivity area. So this can be kept either at a particular temperature ramp or it can be kept at a constant temperature. And this can be kept at, at cool temperatures. And what that means is that you can take and you can heat this part up without heating this part, which is important in terms of the sealing technology because otherwise the thermal expansion coefficients will ultimately mean that you get leaks or breakings of the chips. Um, and so these can, you can view them in many ways as, as, as just a, a tube that coils up and runs back again. And then there are, in addition to that, there are mixing elements and there are quenching elements that are introduced into the systems. So, I will start talking sort of from the bottom up in terms of the list I had. I'll talk about the optimization first. Um, so if you think about having your microreactor, which may have a, some way of mixing integrated in it, you have a control pumping system, you have a way of measuring up uh, what you produce. If you combine that whole system with uh, control of the temperature, you should in principle be able to just have automated synthesis. You should, the, you know what you make, you can change the temperature and see what you make then. Uh, you can change the flow rates and see what the impact of that is. You combine that then with optimization programs in your computer and you should then be able to optimize the whole reaction and you should basically be able to push a button, walk away and think about the next problem instead of just having to stand there and do all those manipulations you normally would have to do in batch. Now, the first thing to think about in terms of being able to do this in microfluidics is that if we design these microfluidic systems optimally, we can avoid having significant dispersion effects. And without the dispersion effects, time and space becomes interchangeable. And that's very, very useful because if you think about when you normally do chemistry experiment, you will take your mixture and you will 
reacted in a batch reactor, and you'll measure the time course of the reaction. If you do work in a continuous system, you group reactions at one condition, and so you only get one data point, but it's very stable. And so in some sense, what I would like to have is a combination of the two systems. And so the two systems, if you think about it, in the batch reactor, as the reaction progresses, when I've reacted a certain time, that corresponds to exactly the same residence time in my flow system. So if I change my residence time in my flow system, I should essentially get the same thing as a batch reactor, but with the advantage of having a flow reactor. And indeed, that's what happens. So this is here, the residence time. And you can see as I increase the flow rate from a high value to a low value, uh, my residence time will increase, and so I will go up this ramp. As I do that, I trace out the um, reaction curve here, now not plotted against the time in the batch reactor, but the residence time in my flow reactor, which is exactly the same thing. And so I can get a time course, and I can do this for different ramps, and you can see they overlap. The x's here is what you, if you do individual steady state experiments, and you can see that those also correspond. But it's much easier, obviously, just to change the flow rate while you're already running than having to do separate experiments. You can then have this combined with a computer control. So this is a Paul-Noor reaction, just as an example, it has two steps. Um, we have the computer set the temperature, and it ramps the residence time by changing the flow rate from fast to slow. Um, and that traces out one curve. It can then go to another temperature, do the same thing. And in a span of eight hours, and just using five millimoles of materials, you have now traced out all the information that you need to get the kinetics for this particular reaction. Um, you can see this is a second. This is two reactions, reactions in here. Each of them are first order. And we can get the activation energies. If you were to do this as steady state, you would have to run experiments at 10, 20, 30, 40. And each uh, experiment, we would just have data points here, right? You wouldn't have these continuous curves. And so you have a lot more data uh, material that you have to use before you actually can collect the data and let, with the result of actually having less data for more material and longer time to run the experiments. Um, so we could use this to get kinetics. And the other nice thing about using these types of kinetics is we can use, as I said, small amounts of experiment ex expensive reagents. We can it's easier to scale up. We can avoid temperature gradients. We can make sure we have got things mixed. We can look at very fast reactions. And we don't have a headspace. Right? One of the big problems with running things in batch is that you get stuff in the vapor above it that often is the pipe that you have to be very careful about in terms of the safety of the experiment. And when you start sampling, is if you're really sampling from the liquid or from the gas. So we can avoid all of that. And so you could begin to think about creating techniques for actually very efficiently extracting kinetics. So we do this by using factorial designs then coupled with statistic, um, statistic experimentation. So first we do a simple factorial design. We use that to get a model. Then we take that model and say we want to minimize the variation in our uh, parameter estimates. And um, to do that, um, if we do the analysis, it will say, well, run the experiment here. That should minimize it. And there are really two things you can, can do here. Right? You can minimize the variation, and you can optimize the information. So if you think about costing this in terms of how much information you get from the experiment, uh, you can optimize the information. And so you could use this both to minimize the variation in the parameter estimate, but also to optimize your information of what is the correct model to use for the particular system. And so let me start first with the model. So as a simple example, this is all the coupling reaction. So you could think about four different reaction mechanisms, or reaction expressions. Uh, we all, I think, know which one is the correct one in this particular simple case. But you know, this might be second order, this might be second order, maybe it's reversible. Um, and so you like to run this system and find out what is the correct model to use. So we run a simple half factorial with four experiments, and then we run one more experiment. And we know what the accuracy of our HPLC measurements is. We know how accurate we can control the temperature in the experiment and so on. 
And this gives us the probability distribution then when we begin to predict the model based on the experiments that we've done and the errors in those experiments. And so you can see here is rate model one in blue and two is in red, green is in this model uh, two, sorry. And model three, I'm, these are shifted, sorry. Uh, the purple should be model four here. The purple is all the way down here, and that's because you've, got, you've done five, five experiments, right? You've got two parameters. So within the accuracy of your system, you can't determine anything about those parameters. But they all overlap in terms of predicting the outcome of the isoprene from the reactor, and so we have no information. But you can now take this and use what's called the Fisher information matrix to get the information necessary to plan the next experiment that will separate these uh, systems. So we run experiment number six, and you now notice that only model one fits the data, is consistent with the data. And so we now have, uh, we now know which model we should use for describing our reaction. We can then run additional experiments to get accurate rate experiments. So now we know the chemistry, and so if you wanted to scale this reaction, your chemical engineering friends, if you tell them the kinetics, they know enough fluid mechanics that they can do the heat transfer and the fluid mechanics. And so this is now a scale up of 500. So these experiments were done in this little silicon uh, pyrex reactor, and they're scaled to this corning reactor that has um, seven plates in it, so about 60 milliliters of volume. Uh, each of those have particular dispersion characteristics that you can determine by doing resistance time distributions. And so if you take that into account, you can take then the kinetics, you can model the heat transfer through the plates, and you can then predict the performance. And these are the experimental numbers that we find, or that Jonathan McMullen found, and you can see that we have excellent agreement between the two. The advantage, too, at this point of having a model is, of course, you understand the system. So if you were to ask, what is the most important thing to understand in this particular system? And the answer is, in fact, the heat transfer. Because there's a reasonable activation energy, so your reaction is quite sensitive to how accurate the temperature is controlled in the system. We can do the same things for multiphase systems. So to do the, illustrate that, I wanted to start with a spiral reactor and then show the Corning low flow reactors. These Corning reactors are reactors that are built of layers of glass. Uh, they're actually built here in Fontainebleau. Um, and, um, and you can scale these um, by essentially scaling the structure of these. So this is a low flow. Uh, each plate is about 0.7 milliliters. These are about 8 milliliters or 7 in size. Uh, and you can see they consist of individual mixing elements where the fluid comes in, hits this baffle, flows around, gets constricted, expanded, and so on as it flows through the system. And that becomes important in terms of understanding the mass transfer in the system. And the single flow reactor here, which is 400 microns across, we will just have the standard um, slug flow type arrangement or segmented flow arrangement with the Taylor cells providing most of the mixing in the system. Whereas in these types of systems, what happens when the fluid comes in and what you're looking at here is hexane and water, you can see you break it up the, into droplets. These droplets continue to break up, so at the end when you get through the whole plate, you have very small droplets and very large interfaces, which of course enhances the mass transfer in the system. But the price you pay for that is that this fluid flow phenomenon, as you might guess, only happens if you have a sufficient velocity because you need enough velocity to, that you actually can get enough inertial in the flow to get that phenomenon to happen. So. Just as a simple example, um, this is oxidation. Uh, this should be 2014. Of course, we're not that far up, but anyway. Um, um, oxidation with bleach. Um, so if you just take swimming pool material, right, uh, that you use in the swimming pool, you react it here, and we can get the, the oxidized product. In the spiral reactor, you notice we have to go up to very large flow rates of the aqueous component with the bleach before we get the same high conversion that we already see much earlier in the Corning low flow reactor, 
And that's actually quite understandable in terms of the mass transfer characteristics of these systems in the sense that in the spiral reactor, it takes me up to a minute of residence time to get to full conversion. And so if you look at how the behavior of the mass transfer coefficients in the systems are, this would mean that in my spiral reactor, I'm out somewhere off the chart here at a very low mass transfer coefficient. <laughs> Whereas if I use these um, high flow corning reactors, I get very accurate, um, very, sorry, very high mass transfer rates and therefore a much better conversion for a much shorter residence time, which in turn means that my productivity is much higher of those types of reactors. And so, um, and you can see here, you can get the same conversion and yield between the low flow and the advanced flow reactor because they essentially have the same design, even though this is 10 times bigger. This leads to how people actually think about scaling these reactors. So, so 10 years ago, when people really began to do micro-reactors or more, um, you know, people would ask, well, how are you going to scale it? And the standard answer is, I'll just multiply it out. Well, you take small devices and you try to build a way of passively controlling flow to a thousand small devices, that is not very easy to do. So what actually has become a much fe more feasible way to think about this is, in many cases, the critical dimension for you is the heat transfer dimension. So you want to keep this distance between the coolant, which is the green here, um, the same so that you can cool your fluid very ac accurately. And then what you like to do is to have the same kind of mixing characteristics as you go from small reactors to large reactors. And you know that's actually very cleverly done here because it's exactly the same mixing pattern that we had here as I showed you earlier in the smaller plate, which was this. So you repeat the mixing pattern and then you multiply it out on the disk in such a way, on the chip, if I can call it that, or the plate, in such a way that you split up, you, you reduce the pressure drop in the system while maintaining the same local flow characteristics. And so as you go up in size, uh, these systems are no longer microfluidic systems. They're maybe what you would call millifluidic systems. But you make 300 kilograms an hour in such a system. And so there is a way to go from the microfluidics all the way to production scale. Now I showed you how we can optimize things when we change concentration temperature. But as a chemist, there are lots of other things you would like to do. So in addition to what I would call the continuous variables, if you think about sort of a catalytic reaction like this that's driven by a palladium catalyst, you also have to, you can change the ligand. You know, it depends on what chemical structure you put around that palladium central molecule. You could, uh, atom, you could have different cal catalytic characteristics. Uh, you could change what you use as your original palladium source, what type of organometallic. You can change the solvent. You can change the catalyst. Uh, that if, if it's a multi-phase system, you can change whether it's a phase transfer ca catalyst, and you can change the base. And similarly, there are other things that could be done in a discrete fashion. But this is difficult, right? It's very easy to figure out how I can dial the temperature or how I can dial. But how do I get it automated so you also can do all those discrete variables? So. This, I think, is where segmented flow and using droplet microfluidics become a very useful tool. So we can have an auto sampler that essentially makes up the mixture that we need to do the reaction. The auto sampler then injects the droplet in here, and you can have it so that it injects a second reagent afterwards into the drop. We know how to do that. People have demonstrated that in droplet microfluidics. And we can have an inert carrier phase to take all this through. So the classical way of having the inert carrier phase would be to have a, a perfluorinated oil. And in many cases, that works. But once you start doing chemistry at elevated temperatures, that's no longer such a feasible thing. Because unfortunately, as you go up in temperatures, organic solvents and perfluorinated materials become miserable. And so you no longer separate the drops, and you begin to have ways in which you can get transport from one droplet to the next droplet. So we actually tend to use um, nitrogen or argon as the separating medium here to uh, avoid that 
And so that flows through. We then in a, heat it up in the reactor. You get your reacted slugs. And then you can measure that if you send it into an HPLC mass spec system. Uh, you don't have to wait for the HPLC. You don't have to make such a beautiful chromatogram because you have the mass spec. And so you can speed up the, um, the analysis time. And then you feed this back uh, and make, again, just like before, decisions about what to do in terms of running it. And so this is sort of what it looks like. Here's the nitrogen line going through to the system, the liquid handler bringing it in the reactor, and then we actually tend to run this under, a, because of the gas in the system, we run it under 100 PSI back pressure to con also control the outgassing in the system. So let me give you a couple of examples of the applications of this. So if you want to do an alkylation of this particular compound, you would like to do it just once. So you just want to add it on to one of the amine group. You don't want to add it on to the second one. The difficulty here is you very often add it on to the second one. Now, in this particular case, the transition state is charged, and so it shouldn't matter what you picked as a, as a solvent. So um, here's sort of I'm gonna, 10 different or more common solvents. And so we've done like we did before. We started with a simple factorial design. And based on that, we try to predict what would be best. And you can see the error bars here are huge. And we have things that says this should be 200% yield, which is obviously nonsense, um, but that's you know, the kind of initial data that you get just from the screen. But you can see already the DMSO is much better than any of the other solvents in the system. So one can then design algorithms, and I won't go into the detail of the optimization algorithms, but I'll certainly be happy to talk afterwards. Um, that essentially continues to do these experiments. And remember, this is automated, so it's not you doing the experiments. It's just a question of a little extra time to actually run these experiments. And as we get up to so over 65 experiments, uh, all of these now have shown that with better than 10% accuracy, all of these other solvents are essentially not capable of getting as good a result as the one that we can get with the DMSO. And from a chemical standpoint, that's actually quite understandable because of the stabilization of the transition state. So what about if we want to do a catalytic selection? So this is a classical suzuki miyara cross-coupling reaction. It involves a palladium ligand uh, uh, catalyst. Um, and there are not, lots of different things you can choose from. So, which, so if you go to the catalog, which of all of these might be the best one to pick? And even once I do that, I can, I can actually verify, I can change this L, the, the ligand that sits here considerably in terms of just going with a simple phosphine or with these um, book wall type uh, catalysts here. And again, the same principle as before, and you could see here that after about less than 50 experiments, uh, there are three sets of catalysts that are basically equivalent in terms of being the optimal catalyst for this reaction, and there are some that are terrible, right? But we know that and you could do this by using this droplet fluidics to really understand how you can do this optimization. And I think this could ultimately be a great way of coming up with understanding uh, catalyst catalytic reactions and, um, and, and, and be able to develop in new systems. Now, most chemists um, don't just want to do a single transformation. Right? They want to build large molecules. And so um, how do we actually do that? And so let me give you an example. So here, we want to make this what's called a triflate, which is a very good intermediate. Um, unfortunately, the best solvent for that is dichloromethane. On the other hand, the second reaction we would like to do is, again, is a palladium coupled reaction, so-called HEC reaction. Um, really works best in toluene and DMF. So I have to change the solvent. So the first step here, we do the first reaction in the first microreactor. Now, this has an amine in it, and it also has the dichloromethane in it. I first want to get rid of the amine. So somehow I have to wash it with a weak acid to neutralize it and take the amine out of the system. Well, so I have to do a, basically a, a, an extraction process. So the way you do this in the lab, right, is you put it into a funnel, and you shake it, and you wait for it, and let gravity settle it. Well, if we are at microfluidic conditions, Surface tension dominates. And so it's going to be, you know, like your straw and your, your drink. You, you can't get it to separate because the gravity doesn't drive the process. It's the surface tension that drives it. 
And so since that's the case, why don't we just let the surface tension also drive the separation? So in these systems, we send in a mixture here of organic, which is sort of the purple line and the aqueous. And as it flows into the system, the organic wets this Teflon membrane. It has micron-sized pores in it. That blocks the water from going through. Then you put a pressure ac across this to drive the organic phase through, and so the organic phase will flow through. Now, there's a limit to how high a pressure you can put through here. The higher the pressure drop you put across here, the more you will get of a flow. But what actually separates those two is the capillary pressure. So if the pressure gets higher than the capillary pressure, you will again just get a two-phase flow coming through the membrane, which of course doesn't help you. So you actually have to control the pressure drop here accurately. And we used to do that, and there are many ways you can do that in the lab. You can do that simply by using different lengths of tubes, of course. Uh, and you can buy expensive controllers, but it's kind of a painful. So Andrea Adamo came up with a wonderful idea. Yeah, well, why don't we just develop a polymer membrane here that is preloaded to a certain pressure drop? And in this way, that polymer membrane will open, only open if you have the correct pressure drop in the system. And so in this case, we can balance the pressures over the system. You can make a simple in integrated liquid-liquid extraction system, and you can actually take these and couple them and build countercurrent uh, liquid liquid extraction because they're totally independent of each other. So that gets us then the ability to then wash it. So out of this now comes my organic solution of, with the triflate. But I still have to get rid of the, the, um, the dichloromethane and add in either the DMF or toluene. Well, fortunately, dichloromethane boils at a much lower boiling point than either of these. And so if I could just figure out how to distill it off, I could get rid of it. And of course, I can do that the same way as before, because if I just take it in, I heat it up so I create a vapor, I can do exactly the same separation. The liquid will emit the membrane and go out the bottom. The vapor will go up the top. And so I can get a single stage distillation this way. Now, if you take, though, a microfluidic system and you just heat it up, and many of you may have tried this, since you have these small dimensions and the strong effects of surface tension, you tend to get superheating, and so you get explosive nucleation uh, of the vapor when it comes out. So rather than doing that, we add in a small amount of nitrogen so that the vapor partitions into the nitrogen phase, and then you can easily do the separation. So in the end, we can separate then out the DCM, add in the toluene, and do the last step, and end up with the product that we desired. The other problem that one runs into in terms of dealing with microfluidics and chemistry is that so much chemistry produced byproducts. So many of these coupling reactions, they're very important for pharmaceutical compounds, for instance. Um, most involve forming circular metric, metric, metric amounts of salt. And so how do we deal with salts in these kinds of systems? And so here you see what happens initially is you form thin layers of salt on the walls, and of course the pressure goes up. And then you get to a catastrophic where you actually form aggregates of the salt crystals, and the whole thing blocks, and the pressure shoots up. So this here, one can take care of this continuous constriction by periodic washings. But this problem here, one way one can potentially deal with this is you can use ultrasound. Because if you can couple the ultrasound into the channel, what will happen to the aggregate, and I don't know if you can see the aggregate here, it's not the clearest movie, but when you add the ultrasound, what happens is you simply blow the aggregate apart because you get nucleation of small gas bubbles around the aggregates, and that fo forces the aggregates apart. And so you can keep things flowing under those conditions. And this is a very simple microreactor that was built with that principle. It has a Teflon <coughs> channel structure, which has the effect that it's very difficult to nucleate on the Teflon, and therefore we don't get so much deposition on the Teflon. And then this is sandwiched with a piezoelectric element, so we can control the input in terms of the frequency. And so without any input, you can see we have these large crystals out here, which are the ones that will begin to bridge a 400 micron channel, as that was. And as we add in the, the ultrasound, we can bring that down to about 10 microns, which you then can flow through the system. So there are ways in which one can address that. Now. Um, 
I don't want to go through a, a lot of chemistry, but we've actually taken, with the help of Tim Jamieson, who's a chemist, and Alan Myerson, who works on uh, crystallization and purification, these ideas to build what the sponsor likes to call the pharmacy on demand. But this system, which is an American-sized refrigerator, we hope to get it down to a European-sized refrigerator, um, actually makes on demand in a day more than 1,000 doses of standard pharmaceuticals in the purity that you can deliver to a patient. Um, and I don't know what goes on in the government offices, but um, you know, this is a painkiller. This is Valium. This is a Benadryl, which you know, helps with itching. And the last one is Prozac, but uh, those are the ones they wanted us to make. Um, and what it has here is, this is actually the microfluidic parts. These are just the reactors and separators. This is the chemical stock room. These are all the pumps and then the electronics. And on the back side is the purification system. So with that, let me change gears and talk a little bit about nanoparticles. And um, so nanoparticles are typically grown if, so we've all heard about cadmium selenide and all the wonderful things you can do with those. The main problem with that material is the cadmium. So we would like to have material that have emissions in the same range as cadmium, but without having the toxicity issues associated with it. And so there's a lot of interest in using indium phosphide-based materials. These are grown at 300 degrees C. And when you do them in batch, um, you introduce the phosphine precursor along with the indium precursor, and you can see this is the initial nucleation stage. This is actually what determines your size distribution of crystals. And of course, the narrower your size distribution is, the better the luminescent characteristics of your crystals. So this becomes a wonderful test of whether your students are able to pay you know, computer games. Uh, but clearly not a very scalable technology. So why not do this in microfluidics where you can actually control? And the other thing you can then begin to do is to answer questions that people have had is, what is important in this process? Is it an issue of mixing? Is it an issue of how long you actually have the crystals sitting around? And you can separate those effects because you can first study the mixing temperature and then you can study the aging temperature. So um, when you look at these, these are just absorption spectra. They're just offsets so that we can see them individually. What's really important is this resonance structure here. This is actually what determines what you get in terms of emission. And so the more well-defined this is, the better material you have in terms of the optical properties. And you can see there's really no difference here with, the, with temperatures of mixing. On the other hand, if I change my temperatures of aging, you see that there is a significant effect. And in, in fact, the higher temperatures I can go, the better. Um, and that has to do we think with you form lots of small nuclei here that then have to fuse and grow into larger nuclei to ultimately form the quantum dot. Now, this is at 340 degrees. Or, so the issue here is what can I use as a solvent? So normally what you do when you do it in batch, you do it with, um, as I showed before, sorry, um, if you have to do this is 300 degrees, but the only thing that you could do is a very long chain hydrocarbon like squalene. That's a very poor solvent. We would like to use good solvents. They're easy to get. They're inexpensive. And so actually, we do this in octane. And the octane here, uh, because you are in that 65 bar in order to keep it liquid, also happens to be supercritical. And that's actually also helpful in terms of controlling the nucleation properties of the crystal. So um, now, we also would like to be able to grow these crystals so they get to be bigger. And so in order to grow these crystals so they get to be bigger, um, we have to be able to add materials slowly into the system. So to add materials slowly into the system, we built microfluidic systems that have these um, resistances at the inlets. And then we slowly uh, add it so that we can control gradual addition. And so if you look at this, you can see that the color, as we just take here pure quantum dots, and then we dilute back with, with hexanes, you can see the color intensity disappears gradually. We can use then to that to do sequential growth. And with that sequential growth, 
we can now shift the peak out to larger wavelengths, which means we've grown bigger dots. Then we have this. Um, we can then do multi-step synthesis using uh, core shell structures. So in order to actually get good quantum emission out of these systems, you have to cover it by another material with a higher band gap. So we're going to cover it with zinc selenide. So we just showed you how we could grow indium phosphide. We then have to put a shell on that, and then we have to anneal it, and then we have online measurements of what actually happens in the system. And so this is just a picture of what actually happens when you see it in the dark and you put UV illumination on it. And you can see as we finally grow the shell, you get larger and larger illumination from it. Um, these kinds of techniques can also be used to do quantum dots, not quantum dot nanoparticles for catalysis. You know, there's a lot of interest in being able to make various types of materials that one can then use for catalysis. And depending on what you use here as your reduction agent, you can get what I would call sort of fractal structures, almost like these. Uh, they're a very porous structure and therefore have high surface areas. If I chose to use, say, a, a, a stronger reductant here, I can end up with just getting a single particle. Um, these still have crystalline, and you can make them of different variations, like here, make platinum. You can mix it with different other noble metals, so you can also make um, magnetic materials, and they're actually excellent uh, oxidation reaction catalysts. Um, this is what you would buy from Sigma Aldrich. This is what you get in terms of the performance in doing a CV diagram, and, and you can see that you uh, get much better uh, performance out of these. But the problem is that these types of materials come as nanoparticles, right? Then you want to use them in a catalytic reactions. And so then you have to figure out how do I get rid of them afterwards. And actually, if they're noble metal, you like to recover them and reuse them again. So it would be nice if we could find a way to use those nanomaterials in a larger scale. So what we'll do is we'll take the silica shell on an uh, iron oxide core. These are about 100, little less than 100 nanometers. These you can make by the Stuber, classical Stuber process. Um, we send them into a microreactor and grow the nanoparticles on those silica particles. And so you can see we now have these nanoparticles um, on, on the sphere. And then we have these 100 nanometer spheres, but we still like to have those in much larger so, so we can still manipulate them. But I can take those and use sort of the David Waits type microfluidics to make much larger particles because we can take the aqueous stream that I have with my particles. They're decorated with platinum nanoparticles. We flow them into with a perfluorinated oil. They will form a dripping flow here that then forms little droplets. Each of those droplets are exactly the same size. We take those droplets, we put them on a Teflon material so that they don't call so they don't wet, so they stay intact, and we dry them. And when you dry them, all the little particles that were in them coagulate to form a larger particle, and now we have large particles that are micron size that contains this micro, all these very well-defined structures that have the nano uh, platinum particles on them. And so we now have this hierarchical material that we can use to actually do reactions in a pack bed reactor. And because it has this very high surface area, you see with this blue line here that relative to the other types of catalysts that you can purchase, you get much higher activity because you've got this finely divided material, but you have the same selectivity. And this is again true in terms of, of you can take these particles out since they're magnetic. You can characterize them and see they haven't centered. And you can, in principle, put them back into the reactor again. Just one final example of, of making nanoparticles. Uh, this is a, if we take a silicon, so people, particular Nomi Hallas, have made gold covered silica spheres. Um, if we take these, silica, if we take silica spheres, but instead of using smooth silica spheres, we make the silica spheres rough. Then we nucleate gold nanoparticles on them. Now, what's going to happen if we control the nucleation and the transport to the particle, 
we can make it so that it is much more advantageous for the goal to grow on top of the mountain as opposed to down in the valley. And so what actually happens is you starve the nanoparticles there in the hollows relative to the nanoparticles there on the top. And as a result of that, you grow these very long strings of nanoparticles off the side. And so now you have these sea urgents of nanoparticles. And you can again do this in, in, in a microfluidic systems, and you can actually carefully control where you are in the whole region, and so you can control the emissions of them too. But what's, and there are single crystal, but perhaps what's most interesting is you can then take them and do what we did before, use the same kind of self-assembly of these nanoparticles to now make three-dimensional structures that one can then use to do surface-enhanced Raman uh, by essentially just impregnating them with the material that you want to study. So to finish up, as I mentioned, I will do a very short uh, description of, of the transvection process. So you could do this with viruses, right? But then you have the problem that you can get foreign DNA in it, which has always been an issue. You can do electroporation, but you can imagine what the cell feels like after having repeatedly been shocked. Um, you could do liposomes, biopolymers, uh, or you can do cell penetrating peptides, uh, but those are very specific methods. And what we were curious about was could you come up with a general way in which you could introduce macromolecules and um, nanoparticles into cells? And it shows up that if you take cells and you take them through a constriction, and you do this at very high velocities, um, you could essentially force the openings in the cell. So if the cell comes through here, it opens up an opening in the cell, and whatever you else have in the medium here will diffuse into the cell. And this can, of course, with a typical uh, microfluidics, can be parallelized. So we can take uh, this microchannel and we can uh, have 50 at them in parallels, and so you begin to be able to do enough cells that you can use standard biological tools like uh, fluorescence activated cell sorting to actually look at the results. So what happens is the cell comes in along with the delivery, it gets squeezed, it's open, things begin to flow through the disruptive membrane, and the membrane recovers. And so what I'm going to show you in terms of results, um, when I define delivery ex uh, efficiency, that is essentially the efficiency of material deliver some potent as percent of the live cells with uh, relative to the total live cell population. So it clearly depends on what your um, how how big this restriction is. So and the length of this restriction. So this is the width of the restriction. This is the length of the restriction, and this is the number of restrictions. And so by Decreasing the length of the restriction and increasing the number, we can increase um, the transfer into the cell of just a simple sugar molecule here that's labeled, which is relatively small. Um, and you can see here that not with much cost in, in, in viability. All of this, we can also take the cells out right after we squeeze them. So we know how quickly does the cell actually repair itself. And you can see here that the, the cell membrane closes up relatively rapidly. So most of the delivery occurs right within the first minute of the treatment of the cell, and thereafter it closes up. Um, and it seems to occur by diffusion, because what happens is uh, if I deliver material, um, and then I send the same cells through the system, but I don't deliver anything, then things diffuse back out again. Then if they take the same cell population, I put them back in again with additional material, I can diffuse it back in again. So it seems like it's simple, the simple diffusion mechanism through openings in the cell. The cell is actually, uh, if we look at how it's actually coming into the cell, is a diffuse staining. If you had an endocytotic delivery, which would be sort of the other way one would think it would come in, you would tend to see um, the endosomes then light up and you should have a much more punctuated fluorescence from the cell. Now, we've done this for, by now, 12 different cells. What I think is most interesting is that we can actually do it for immune cells, which leads to a number of possibility for developing vaccine-type uh, strategies. But as you can see here, they can also be done for um, fibroblast cells and, and embryonic stem cells. Um, so I wanted to show that it actually ends up in the cytosol, and this was worked on with Munji Bawendi. Um, so here, um, if we take 
and we link a die to our quantum dot. What happens under normal circumstances is that the fluorescence that comes from here is much higher energy and so it will dump into the red dye here and so instead of seeing the green color you see all you see is the red color. So if I take and I put these into cells, um, oh, and then the important point is as a disulfide bond which is the reducing environment inside the cells would get cleaved. On the other hand if it went in through the endosomes nothing will happen to it. So what should happen then is I get my particles into the systems if, if they're in the endosome, they should, uh, the red dye should be cleaved and I should be green color. If they're in the endosomes, they should just remain red. And so this is what you see after the delivery. Um, if you have the delivery, you see it starts off being red, then everything begins to turn green as the cytosol reduces the disulfide bond and then ultimately you get some decrease in the luminescence. So it all goes into the cytosol. If I send it in just through the endosome you wouldn't see that effect. So it does go into the cytosol and it also raises the opportunity for looking for different ways of identifying circulating tumor cells. So circulating tumor cells tend to be bigger than the normal cells. So when we do this squeezing, this squeezing is very much dependent, of course, of how big the cell is. If it's a small cell, it just goes through the restriction without being squeezed. If it's a big cell, it gets squeezed. So why not simply take a system where you label the, the white blood cells, and then you have also a label that will only diffuse into anything that has gotten opened up, uh, which is this fluorescently label. Now, if the, seat, the circulating tumor cells is much larger, this should be destroyed or opened up rather, rather than the white blood cells and so you should only see the circulating tumor cells and then when you do your fluorescence activated cell sorting you should be able to sort those fr from the system and you should only be able to sort out then the circulating tumor cells. And indeed these are all uh, the circulating tumor cells. We get about 42% purity with 76% recovery um, and we have a few missed circulating tumor cells here, but the nice thing is that since you can get these out and you can identify them, you can also do genetic analysis on these and so you have them so you can do additional analysis. So with that, um, I think, hope I've shown you that with these automated microsystems that we can do chemical kinetics, we can do optimization, we can learn about the systems, we can integrate these systems uh, into continuous synthesis and we can use them to do nanoparticle structures of a variety of different things and we can actually use them to kind of um, be able to do hierarchical materials. I didn't have time to show you here but we can also take fluorescent quantum dots and make large big fluorescent balls basically use the same ideas here and then um, as sort of an example of at the end is delivering micromolecules across cells we're using a very simple microfluidic example but it has this effect on the cells and we're trying to understand how that actually works. In, in. So uh, to acknowledge, uh, first of all, we'll mention we couldn't really do all of this if it weren't for also all the collaborations we are involved in. This is a highly interdisciplinary field. So the quantum dot work was done with Mundibo Wendy's group um, and these are people from Mundibo. Steve Bookwalt and Tim Jamieson have been very helpful in terms of all the chemistry and Bob Langer and Chris Love are the ones that we worked with on, on all the biological work I showed you. And then of course there is a very large number of very talented students and, and postdocs who have actually done all the work that I've shown you. And so I want to thank you for your attention and the opportunity to be here. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, your talk is perfect because there are a lot of links between what you were presenting and what some people are doing here concerning the transfection, the uh, response of a cell in a confined space, the synthesis of nanoparticles and all the chemical uh, engineering aspect. So this is really perfect. I had only one problem is that with some of the pictures that you showed, I could not prevent myself to think about the clafouti. <laughs> because we talked a lot about that yesterday. <laughs> so, sort of. so now the, this is open to, to questions. <laughs>
thank you very much for the nice talk. I'm a, one, uh, one question concerning the transfection. I'm uh, wondering if when the cell pass this narrow channel, the, the membrane of uh, nucleus also opens some pore for the passage. So, so we we haven't had any we haven't had any evidence that that's happened. Um, and in fact, um, we've been very good at being able to transfect proteins, um, nanoparticles, and so on. Um, but we actually, in some cases, have less success. And we can do siRNA, we can do mRNA. But if we take, for instance, just a simple DNA structure and ask it to express, we get less expression than you would if you did uh, electroporation. And so that would seem to suggest that the nuclear membrane has not been modified. When the, the cell goes through a constriction, do you have an idea of the size of the pores which are open? And how much can you tune that by changing the size of the constriction? And so, so, so we know that there is a variation in size because we've done different sizes of, of, yeah, of, of compound. Way. Um, and so, uh, for instance, it's very easy to get the uh, three kil kilodalton in. Um, we get less at the seven, several kil kilodalton dextran. On the other hand, but that's about a very good marker for how much protein we can get in, for instance. Um, and we try to do electron microscopy, but we still don't have images that are good enough to actually ask, answer that question accurately. The other question is, the mechanism is that the tension increase, the, the tension of the membrane increases in the constriction. Would any way of increasing the tension do the same thing, or is there something else going in? Well, so people, you know, some of the first transfection people did was just to squeeze things like this, right? Uh, so I think it's probably the strain, actually, and it does matter uh, how you, how, how fast it, it takes place and how the entrance region looks. And, and I can say we are right now doing a lot of work on the biological side. Because you could, of course, go in and begin to affect the actin skeleton and try, take, and, and try to understand what it actually is that happens in this system. So, thank you very much. Uh, I have two first questions. I'm sorry I was not able to, to put the two ideas in the same sentence. but. Uh, First, oh, sorry. sorry, so that um, how do you choose the chemical reactions you test? Because it seems to me that I'm very bad organic chemist, but uh, it's a deal salder, it's something very classical. So I don't know, how do you choose the, why did you choose that one? Because you have an infinite number of these reactions. So, so I think that's where we've been very fortunate to work with card carrying very good organic chemists. So, um, so when we first started out, we went through you know, the classical reactions that one can think of, um, especially if you're a chemical engineer, they're very simple reactions. But you know, our chemistry friends said, well, that's very nice, but you know, that's not really of interest to us. It doesn't show us that we can do something new. Okay. So you, then you go to your chemistry friends and you begin to talk to them about, and, and as the excitement levels go, increases, you have a good measure of whether or not that's a good molecule to stop it. Okay. So we basically talk to the chemists. So my second question is now, it seems that it's, uh, you can do organic, with um, this kind of devices, you can do like automatic synthesis. It's freed from the operator. So my question is, do you see any reactions or do you see that because as a way to really get for a given reaction the uh, reaction landscape, for example, not only recipes or not only protocols, but to explore some conditions that are usually not explored, not like the possibility, but really to have something like the phase diagram of a surfactant, where you go in all kinds of concentration and so on. And you see that's something that is feasible, to go to something that is more, to go to the chemical physics or the physical chemistry, let's say. So, so I think this is, this kind of technology opens a tremendous opportunity for doing, or maybe we'll call physical organic chemistry. So uh, in the sense that it should allow you to develop 
experiments that can help guide to under the understanding of when reactions don't occur, what type of reactions occur, what are the preferred mechanisms by which they happen, that you then can couple with quantum chemistry analysis. And so you could begin to build a, what I would call a, a richer um, set of descriptors for organic reactions so that when you, as a synthetic chemist, if you're interested in building molecules, you would have a much better guidance in terms of what's feasible. And of course, there's, and there's a huge value in knowing for sure what can't be done, right? And so when you actually begin to think about building molecules for pharmaceutical application where you have to screen lots and lots of reactions, if you had much better idea about what can be done and not be done, these screening experiments, you could probably throw away 40% of them for, from the start. You wouldn't have to run them because you know the result is nil. So I have two questions. First one, you showed this application for the synthesis of quantum dots in the circuits. And the material you get eventually, um, are they, how do they compare to what, peop what people like, for example, in Munji Bawendi's lab, they're able to prepare in terms of brightness or, or size dispersion? Is it better or? So actually, um, so we could do as good as they do in terms of batch. And so, um, right now, we are not able to do anything that's better than they do in batch. But one thing that we've been able to do, and I, I'll be happy to talk about afterwards with too much detail to put in here, is, for instance, water contamination shows up to be a very um, difficult issue. And it's, it's something that you can't really study very well in batch. We have, by doing this in microfluidics, been able to look at the kinetics and the influence of water and, and really see what happens in terms of that, uh, which comes with the injury merisse. Um, and the other thing is the opportunity to understand much better how you do the overcoating, which is related to this issue of contamination, but also the ability to grow new layers. And I, I think that this is where ultimately we will be able to do better than they can do. But it's, of course, a, a huge value to us that we are able to do both. And the quick second question is, the, in the application of delivery with, again, for example, these nanofluorescent nanoparticles in the cytoplasm, have you tried to target specific, um, specific organelles inside, just, just not them deliver in the cytoplasm, but to... S um, no, we have, we, have not, we have not tried to target specific, specific organelles um, at this point. Hi, I have a question on the uh, synthesis on, in, in uh, metafluidic systems. I'd like to know how eager the industry is uh, to adopt those systems. I am aware of only one company in France that makes uh, some of the highest value molecules uh, and they'll sell it to L'Oreal. So, so, um, so the industry, a, so the pharmaceutical industry is, is undergoing a change in terms of how it thinks about production, as you know, for centuries, right, they have sort of worked in making a batch, you purify the material from the batch, you redissolve it, and you make another. And there is now a great deal of interest in being able to make continuous processing. That's driven, one is because you can get better control over the quality, because you can do online measurements and so on. Another driver for this is the cost. And, a, and I think an important driver for it is really what you call personalized medicine, right, in the sense that the days of being able to make medications that fit the whole world population in one is probably not there, right? And so what, what we really need to be able to do is to make smaller amounts of very targeted pharmaceuticals. So there's this great interest in that industry for that kind of material. There's also an interest of this technology. There's also an interest in fine chemicals, again, because of the high value. The difficulty that I think is faced in the United States and in Europe is that we already have lots of plants. Right? We have lots of places where we can make these things. And so you, when you have to think about a new technology, the manager says, yeah, but it'll cost me money and I already have this plant I can use. That's not true in China. And so a lot of the investment you see happening today in this technology actually happens in China. Because they're building up new plants. Thanks. <laughs> 
So in the application to um, uh, CTC detection, um, I was under the impression that CTCs, real ones, the ones that uh, are extracted from blood, not, you know. Uh, so these were real. Right, right. But uh, the, the, they had um, huge dispersion in size. So right. is, that, is that a limitation? I guess it is. But are there situations where the technology you propose would be better suited to uh, detecting these cells uh, or not? So, so this clearly only works if you have a situation where the cells are very different in size. You need a good contrast, yes. Right, you need a good contrast. And so, um, so, so in this particular case, which actually are uh, pancreatic cells and from, a, from, a real pa from a patient, so these are, are real cancer cells. They're not you know, something we... Oh, okay, so it, it, it's not spiked with no. cells. That, okay, all right. And so you see, you see the size difference in this particular case in the, in the fluorescent image here. So there's a significant, and when you go back here and, and well, it's a pancreatic cell model. It's not, this is a model, but right now we are actually using it for clinical samples. Um, what you see here, or Chris Love is using it for clinical samples. What you see here is that we captured, you know, about, um, 76% of them in 42% purity, okay? But there are these blue ones here down here are missed cells. And the, and the ones we miss are likely because they're too small. So we don't get all of them, no. So you couldn't use this as a purification, but the idea here is you could use it as a tool to pull them out and actually be able to study their genetics. Right, this is. Okay. John Lee, yeah. Yes, it's still going on on this question. How you label them, but how then you sort them uh, optically? We sort them with, with a, a flow standard, cytometer? Or, with or, a standard flow cytometer. Okay. So these images are after collection. That's right. So those uh, are the standard. Uh, mm -hmm. These are the, the standard uh, you know, plots you would get when you do the analysis of your flow cytometer data. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So the nice. I think one of the advantages of, 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 of being able to use this is that since we can do, this is often a problem with microfluidics, right? You get 500 cells. And so it's very hard to use any of these standard tools. Here the biologists can basically use, you know, the classical flow cytometry kinds of techniques because you have 100,000 or more cells. Yeah, I know. But we have, I heard, I heard your question. No, but the question was whether we could work with raw blood. Uh, we haven't tried. I said we haven't tried working with just blood itself. This is done with zero. Uh, two, two other questions. So we can do immune cells. So the question was this pore formation, can we do this for very fragile cells? So we can do it for stem cells without actually having them, them differentiate afterwards. <coughs> and we could do it for immune cells. I, I missed the information. What about the viability for stem cells? Um, I think I, they might, I might have them here. So you could see it depends on what you, how, how, how aggressive you are, right? Okay. Thanks. And actually, so here what one does is to really optimize. So, so what we do, uh, to optimize this is to change the, the width of the channel and the number of constrictions. And so you could, be, for a specific cell type, you can actually optimize the device. Uh, so my question goes in the same direction. So, um, so I guess what you change is the cross-section of the real constriction and also the velocity of the flow. But uh, you also could see that your, your, um, you have a maximum of transfection in one minute interval. And my question was, uh, do you ch change this, uh, um, uh, this uh, time scale if you change the length of the constriction? Not, not only the cross-section, but also the length. Because then you could think that maybe your pores would get, get open, stay open longer, or not. So, so the length does matter. Does matter. Yes, yeah, so, so here, um, so here, this is, 
These are 20, 40, and 10 microns. So actually, with a 20, you don't get that much delivery. Of course, you have very good viability. As you change it to a longer channel, you actually get better delivery into the system. And then, but you can get actually better delivery by taking five short 10 micron sections. Um, but the long channels still have better um, viability in this particular case. So it depends a little bit too on the cell types, what, what seems to be the optimal way, whether it's a long channel or it's a bunch of little segments that you run. And we don't know yet why that is, and we're trying to understand the underlying biology of how this actually happens and what controls it. And also, what controls the closure. For instance, the calcium, as you might imagine, the calcium ion concentration and the recovery kinetics is very important. So I just uh, looked at the, um, the x, uh, uh, axis. So the, the speed is like half a meter per second. So what kind of pressure do you use? Oh, um, I don't off the top of my head remember what that corresponds to, but we use pressures that go up to about 40 PSI. So, so, so let's see, um, divide that by 15, so about up to three bar. Does that mean that you need something like silicon and uh, these hard devices to do it? Uh, you can go to plastic maybe, but... We can certainly do it in plastic. Um, we, have, um, we haven't built any of these in PDMS, but if I think if you use hard PDMS, you might even be able to get some. But we did not want to also have to deal with the elastic behavior of the polymer on top of everything else. Um, it's easier to, at least we know what the silicon oxide surface looks like. These are made out of silicon, but you know, like the surface is naturally oxidized. Forty to fifty bars, which is so I don't know, forty fifty psi, which would be about three three bar. It is forty it's fourteen point something. I apologize, I'm actually calibrated in the metric system, but the guys that work in the lab are not. Um, but so so it's fourteen point seven PSI to a bar. But still the cells are subjected to a large a large shear. A large shear a large shear stress. Right. And then uh, this 100,000, a shear rate of 100,000 second minus one is quite large. And uh, are they, uh, do they survive? Well, yeah, it's about, depending on what cell type it is, you know, um, we, we typically think we are successful if we can get more than 80% to survive. Given the large numbers we can treat, you know, it's. And also just perhaps, is it right to say that from the point of view of the synthesis of nanoparticles, uh, considering, considering the size of the nanoparticle and the process of nucleation, uh, the typical scale of the nucleation process is still very small as compared to the size of the microsystem, so that finally we are, you are in a similar situation as compared to a batch, and you do not get better properties except that you control better the heat transfer as compared to the batch. Is it right to say that? That is correct to say that because you still don't, uh, you still can't get at the very early in, uh, nucleation phases in these systems unless you go to very high velocities. And, and, uh, but even then, it's very difficult to, to really look at very early stage. Now, I didn't put that in here, but what we have done is you can use these systems to study crystal growth at different crystal phases, right? Because if you send in crystals, and then you control the supersaturation, which you can do in the microfluidic system, and you have a long channel and you can take an image, you can see the crystal in the beginning at the end, and you can then measure the growth rate of all the crystal phases at once. And so you can actually get a lot of information about the crystal growth on already existing crystals that way. Okay, I think we can stop here. Many questions, it was a great exchange. And thank you very much for this. Uh, thank you.